Good morning. The February 10th, 2021 meeting of the Board of Estimates is now called to order. In the interest of promoting health and safety as we continue to deal with COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the board will continue to meet virtually. Uh, at this point, we'll go to the approval of the routine agenda, and I'll ask Comptroller Bill Henry uh, for any corrections or additions to today's agenda. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You. There are no protests for today's meeting. Uh, we have two items being withdrawn. On page 41, item number seven, Bureau of Procurement, contract number B5000 5151, Salt for Snow Removal, Department of Transportation. And on pages 42 and 43, item nine, Bureau of Procurement, contract number B5000 4338, Furnish and Install Carpet, Department of General Services. Uh, the following items are being moved to the non-routine agenda. On page 16, extra work order number 001-SC956, improvements to sanitary sewer collection system in the Herring Run sewer shed. On pages 23 to 25, health department agreements. On page 39, number four, Bureau of Procurement contract number 5000-4069, collection of delinquent parking fines, Department of Finance. On page 53, Department of Public Works, termination of contract. On page 54, Department of Law, notice of litigation outcome. On pages 55 and 56, Office of the Mayor, amended and restated grant agreement with Alliance for Open Society International Incorporated. On page 59 and 60, health department agreements. And on page 77, Department of Communication Services, cooperative agreement with Selco Partnership, doing business as Verizon Wireless. We also have the following abstentions for the Honorable Mayor Brandon Scott on page 23, items number one and two, health department agreements with the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I am abstaining on page three, item number three, Mayor's Office of Homeless Services agreement with Youth Empowered Society Incorporated. Page 54, Department of Law, notice of litigation outcome. Page 61, Department of Human Resources, Personnel Matters, Office of the Comptroller, and page 77, Department of Communication Services, Cooperative Agreement with Selco Partnership, doing business as Verizon Wireless. There are no abstentions for the Honorable President Nick Mosby, Acting City Solicitor James Shea, or Acting DPW Director, Mr. Matthew Garbar. That's all we have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Control Mr. Comptroller. Um, uh, at this point, um, I would direct the board's attention to the memorandum from my office dated February the 8th, uh, 2021, identifying matters to be considered as routine agenda items together with any corrections and additions that our comptroller just provided. I will entertain a motion to approve all items contained on the routine agenda. So moved. A second. It's been moved and properly seconded. All those in favor of approving the items on the routine agenda, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. At this point, the routine agenda has been adopted. Now we will go to the non-routine agenda. Uh, the first item on the non-routine agenda can be found on page 16, the Department of Public Works, uh, EWO number one, in the amount of $273,000 and $770, um, SC, 956, improvements to sanitary uh, sewer collection system in the Herring Run uh, watershed. Um, I'm sorry, the Herring Run sewer shed. Uh, this item, uh, you will recall, was held over last week's meeting. Uh, once again, we have Mr. Yusuf Kababi acting. I know I always put your name. I'm so sorry. Make sure you say your name right for the record. Uh, Bureau Head for Water and Wastewater. Uh, to speak on these items, um, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, uh, Council President and uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Comptroller, members of the board. Uh, Yosef Cabeda. Uh, Cabeda. Cabeda. I'm going. I'm going to eventually get it right, Mr. Cabeda. I got it. 
Not a problem. <clears throat> uh, good morning again. Uh, uh, the uh, project uh, in question, SC956, is one, uh, is one of our uh, sanitary sewer consent decree projects. As you uh, will remember, last week uh, there was a, a, a site confusion on some of the numbers that were presented. Uh, if you will note, the, the correction uh, is that uh, the contract value is actually $7,843,310. Uh, there was a typo in the number and the, uh, in the, that contract value, and that was the one of the reasons for the confusion. But uh, to 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 restate, uh, uh, the DPW is, is requesting approval for additional funds uh, to account for additional concrete uh, uh, work that was uh, uh, originally not accounted for in the estimate. <clears throat> the the project is actually uh, over ninety percent complete. Uh, the only work remaining currently is a uh, final restoration of the areas uh, where, where there was ground disturbance uh, for the installation and repair of sanitary sewer lines. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we have some post-construction uh, closed circuit television uh, submittals that we're waiting on from the contractor. But for the most part, the project is complete. We were able to take beneficial use of the sanitary sewer system uh, at this on this project uh, in November of 2020. Uh, again, the additional concrete uh, was not accounted for uh, during the field um, uh, survey prior to the execution of the project. Uh, what was noted was as asphalt layer, uh, but then uh, uh, during execution, we found that uh, there was actually con uh, was concrete overlaid with asphalt, uh, and so that uh, led to. Uh, the uh, this request for additional funds, and I, I will answer any uh, other questions and provide other details as necessary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Cabetta. Uh, if you could, uh, and I know you kind of talked about it slightly last week, um, but specifically lay out um, the issue around the concrete shortage. Um, we know that these are like typical jobs that this particular vendor is used to kind of performing, particularly in the city of Baltimore, could you kind of lay out why this, um, the lack of um, a, a proper material was not ordered and, and bid on the original job? Sure. So, so typically in the field surveys that are conducted during the planning of the project by the engineer, uh, uh, the, the, uh, there, there is a reliance on as-built uh, for uh, any infrastructure that will be impacted uh, by the project, as well as, like I said, the, the actual eyes of the inspectors and the engineer, the designers uh, in the field. Uh, and, and during that stage, the only indication that, that the engineer we had uh, was that this surface that had to be restored on the back end of the project uh, was, was purely asphalt. Um, and and, and it's, it's one of those uh, situations that you can, uh, I, I guess we would say would be an, uh, uh, an oversight. Um, and uh, we were not aware of the uh, underlying concrete layer uh, uh, when, when bidding the job. Yeah. I, gu I guess the question comes or the motivation behind the question is understanding and knowing that the lowest bid typically wins uh, based off of our charter and kind of where we are that a lot of times when you get to 80, 90% complete uh, and some of these material type of uh, uh, increases are placed on the job, you know, is it reasonably, is it, was it reasonable to expect that um, the original bidder uh, did not know about the conditions uh, to close out a job like this? Uh, as far as the specific conditions uh, with, with the surface, uh, yes, it is reasonable to uh, I expect that the contractor was not aware because when we did the the, the quantity takeoffs, uh, again, the, the concrete was not taken into account. Now, we do have contingency amounts, uh, allowances in, in these bids to allow for these types of unforeseen conditions, to pay for these types of unforeseen conditions. However, this project, uh, there were overruns on, on a, a few line items that I do not have the specifics with me, but the overruns on other items such as manholes, uh, the number of manholes that had to be rehabbed, uh, uh, possibly the length of uh, pipe that had to be rehabbed, uh, the, the contingency amounts were eaten up by these other line items. And therefore, when we got to the point of restoration at 90 plus percent, 
uh, we did not, the project did not have enough funds to account for the cost. Mr. Kibita, what is the uh, city's contingency uh, goal? Is it 10 or 15 uh, percent? It, 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 uh, it, it varies from uh, project uh, to project or project type to project type, but uh, in general, uh, about 10 percent contingency amounts. And uh, I, I do have our uh, facilities lead, uh, Mr. Kuminder Singh, and he can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, roughly around 10 percent. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Armando Singh. I work at the Facilities Engineering Group. Yes, that is correct, sir. We use 10% contingency typically. So 10%. Now, Mr. Uh, Kibita or Mr. Singh, um, how often do we uh, have to utilize contingency on these types of projects? Is it normal that we spend the entire contingency before we close out these types of projects? Uh, again, it's it it it, um, it it that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, I, the, the goal of any any project team is to come under budget and within schedule. Uh, that's why I'm asking the question, uh, Mr. Kabita. But, <laughs> uh, but but again, I, you know, if if uh, uh, we can we can get the stats to see. Yeah, I'm really interested. It, types of project. It, yeah, particularly for a, a project like this again, because it's a pretty straightforward project as it relates to, I guess, you know, the. Um, the original scope of it now you know you always run into problems just really interested if we always run into problems and if we're actually bidding out the jobs right two more just two more quick questions regarding the contingency is that factored in that's if it's 10 percent, it's 10 percent across the board right when i bid so if person a bids a million dollars person b bids nine hundred thousand dollars the contingency is going to be based off of that million that nine hundred thousand dollars just as a flat contingency that we add on to that bid is that how that works Mr. Singh? Sir, typically what we have is unit items and we provide the units, the contractors put and plug in the numbers on what numbers they're going to use for the contingency. That's how we typically do it. Okay. And so it's, so the contingency again is automatically calculated based off of the other line items above that and it's 10 percent of the aggregate of all of those items is that correct that is correct all the numbers are added up as part of the bid price got you and then the summation of that including the items that they have estimated to cost in that contingency that becomes the ultimate bid number that the public sees correct that is correct sir correct and then from there we choose the lowest bid out of either. okay um, the, the last question, have, have there been any additional uh, prior overruns or changes um, outside of like the manhole covering or anything like that, that you know of about this particular project to date? The, this, this particular project, this is the first uh, um, overrun or the first change order that we are requesting. So uh, by and large, you know, again, you know, because there are various unforeseen conditions, we've had to dip into the contingency funds. but. Uh, this is the very first time that we've had to go beyond the original contract value. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cabetta, definitely would, uh, would love to work with you uh, kind of going forward or anybody uh, in DPW and the administration and the mayor's on um, to try to really understand like how often are we really dipping into our contingencies or if we really need to reevaluate that process. Um, again, as a past uh, project manager, kind of understanding though um, the difficulty of, of scoping out some of these jobs like this, but. Uh, when it comes to routine work that we're kind of doing over and over again, we should be driving more towards Six Sigma, more towards some some efficiency associated with our budgeting. And we shouldn't be always going in contingency. Contingency should literally be there for contingency purposes. Uh, so really interested in kind of understanding the data and stats around there. Uh, Ms. Kabita, Ms. Kabita, Kabita, is that right, Kabita? I'm right. All right. That's correct. Right. And yeah. as well as Mr. Singh, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, is there any other additional questions uh, from the board at this time? I see the comptroller, Mr. Comptroller, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I've I've been out of the development business now for about 15 years, so I'm wondering if the the point of a contingency and a budget line has, has changed a little bit. I I I I'm I think I've been assuming all along that extra work orders were not put in until the contingency had been exhausted. Um, and so 
I, I didn't feel like I got a, that, that, that the president, I'm sorry, I didn't feel like the president got a straight answer to that question. Do we require that the contingency be exhausted before, before we submit extra work orders? Or are we submitting extra work orders when there's still money in contingency? You're, you're muted. We, we we do not submit uh, extra work orders if there is already if there is money available in contingency. Okay. So, uh, like I said, in this scenario, the contingency funds were expended. Okay. I, well, you said see that was what threw me in this scenario, which would seem to imply that there might be times when we do submit extra work orders when there is money still remaining in contingency. And I think what I was looking for was a statement of policy that across the board, we don't submit extra work orders until the contingency has been exhausted. Is that true? Th th that is true. Uh, we, we have, uh, uh, you know, fiscal uh, uh, allocates the funds for a particular project. And we, uh, like I said, we try to come under budget. Uh, and uh, uh, but that those funds are what we will use. Um, and only when those funds are expended will we have to uh, reach out again for uh, extra work orders. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. No, thank you. Um, now I see the city solicitor has uh, additional questions. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a question, but to corroborate the concerns expressed in your questions, that means that seven hundred and eighty thousand was already spent on contingencies, and another two hundred and thirty is coming. So that's a million dollar overrun, uh, which does seem to be a, a lot on a project that uh, is similar to others that we've done. So. It's not a question, but I think I think you're right, Mr. President, to to uh, ask for a review. Thank you, Mr. Solicitor. So we'll we'll work with the administration. Look forward to uh, working with you, Director Carbach, uh, and your shop to kind of better understand. Really looking at how we can track out the projects, not just the projects that come in front of the Board of Estimates as it relates to extensions, but also again how we're driving to more towards Six Sigma. Uh, and really closing out these jobs at cost uh, and on time. Um, as you know, Baltimore City, based off of our charter, uh, the lowest bid kind of always wins. I mean, there are some um, variations in that. Uh, that's why that bidding process is so important uh, that we're ensuring that we're getting it right uh, and that we're developing a fair and accurate and uh, appropriate process. So um, if, with that, are there any additional questions or concerns uh, from board members at this time? Hearing and seeing none, um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion regarding this particular line item. So moved. A second. Uh, it's been moved and properly second. All those in favor of approving this item, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Uh, the item is approved. We will move on uh, to the next item on the NARM routine agenda. It can be found on page 23 through 25, the Health Department Agreements. Um, I requested that this that these agreements, as well as another batch of agreements later in the agenda, be placed on our routine uh, to better understand on the idea of how and to what extent local MBE and WBE utilization requirements apply to these agreements. I did receive clarification that many of the agreements on today's agenda are federal and state grants uh, for which the city serves as a pass through entity. Uh, and as a result, our local requirements are non applicable. Um, uh, we have uh, Chief, uh, we have uh, Chief Leslie Thompson, uh, the Chief of uh, Finance and Administration for BCHD, as well as Chief uh, Lachella Miller, uh, Director of the MBU uh, organization here uh, with us this morning. At this time, um, if there are any additional questions or concerns from the floor, um, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Uh, Chief Thompson or uh, Chief Miller. Uh, Chief Thompson or Chief Miller, are you on the uh, line? Hey, yes. Chief Miller, I saw you click in. I'm yes. sorry. Good, good morning, um, Council President Mosby, Mayor Scott, Comptroller Henry, and other members of the board. If Ms. Thompson is on, um, maybe, uh, well, we can go ahead and start. Basically, what the reason why you do find that there are limited opportunities for the MBE and WBE uh, firms is because with the 
program grant programs and initiatives that are facilitated by the health department that we receive um, we our goals do not apply to those uh, programs and as a result of that we cannot apply um, the goals back in January of last year we did reach out to um, Ms. Thompson's team to inquire about opportunities that would create pathways for the minority firms within the city. And um, based on our understanding, they also helped us to get a clear understanding of how their programs work and how the grants are funded. And again, because they are federal and state funded, um, it does exempt our um, goal requirements. Chief Miller, uh, thank you always for the uh, spot on explanation. Um, I think um, as this is not a case where we talk about MBE, WBE uh, opportunities, thankful for the mayor uh, for, for removing or pulling off the two items earlier uh, because of some of these issues. But I think it does, even in this case, kind of point a spotlight on strengthening organizations that are community uh, based, uh, that are boots on the ground, that are more grassroots. We understand and know uh, that some of these grants, when we look at uh, some of the issues, that it's it's really the strength of a relationship of an organization to the population in which we're trying to effectuate change. Uh, we've seen empirical data to kind of communicate and state that. Uh, so how this does not apply to this, I just think, you know, as a board, as we continue to see some of the grants that come in that we're giving out, ensuring that there is a strong diversity of the grants that the city does control uh, to ensure, again, that those grassroots organizations, the folks with the boots on the ground, and the folks with the real community-based uh, organizations and relationships are getting fair play and access to the limited amount of funds for some really, really important work. Uh, with that, I do not have any additional questions or concerns. Are there any at this point from the board? Hearing this I did, I did have one other point to make, uh, Council President, is that yes. we do receive um, uh, submissions from agencies for grant programs. Of course, if there's anything that's uh, related to the city's funds, that is also that is our opportunity to see where our program goals can be applied since we are the city and it is related to city funds. So we do try to exercise all options when we're looking at those funding sources. So I just wanted to add that just as a, um, a measure to show Imbu's efforts in what we're doing to also be proactive. Thank you, Chief Miller. We know that you and your organization does its due diligence and we truly appreciate uh, that work that you, you do. Uh, at this point, are there any additional questions or concerns uh, for Ms. Miller? Uh, at this point, I will entertain a motion regarding this item. Uh, so moved. I second. It's been moved and properly seconded uh, at this point. All those in favor of approving this item, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Mr. President. Yes. I just I just wanted to state for the record as the comptroller noted that I'm abstaining on item one and two of this session. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, at this point, uh, this uh, item has been approved. Uh, again, the mayor, uh, as he, uh, 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 provided the information prior and the controller said prior has abstained from this item. Moving on to the next item on the non-routine agenda, it can be found on page 39, contract number B5000-4069, collection of delinquent parking fines, Department of Finance, PO number P5336641. At this time, I will turn the floor over uh, to again, uh, Chief Miller from MBU, as well as Ms. Keisha Brown from the procurement to speak a little more about this item. Ms. Brown or Ms. Miller? Uh, okay, um, good morning again, Council President Mosby, Mayor Scott, Comptroller Henry and members of the board. Um, this contract was for the payment, uh, collection of delinquent payment uh, for parking fines. And at that time when MBU selected to do the goals back in 2015, the goals were set at 3% for the MBE and 3% for the WBE. Um, the subcontractors that are participating on the contract were selected 
to provide personnel services and staffing. Um, and also those staffing firms were um, selected to provide duties that involved routing calls, scheduling appointments, distributing mail and other clerical and office based um, duties. And um, so far the goals have been met in the, when we did the recent compliance review, they were compliant even though the goals were um, at 3%, but um, that's all we have related to this item. If there are any other questions. Thank you. I, the, the assumption is that 3% is um, exorbitantly low um, for a contract. Is that accurate? Uh, well, based on how we've been conducting the evaluations on the compliance reviews, we, we would agree that it is low. Uh, we unfortunately, I don't know how the goal was determined um, at 3% for both of those categories. But I believe that going forward, if a new bid was to be presented, that it definitely would create opportunity for the goal to be increased so that it would create more opportunities um, for utilization for the MBE and WBE if staffing services would be the same subcontractual services utilized because we do have an abundance of uh, businesses in our program that provide those services. Chief, Chief Miller. Um do you know how long this contract, I'm not sure if Ms. Brown is on, do you know how long this contract uh, has been in effect? We have on record, uh, the bid due date was September 30th, 2015. And I believe there were some renewal options um, attached to it, but I would um, redirect it to Ms. Brown. I see Ms. Brown. Yep, okay. she just popped on. Thank you, Chief okay. Miller. Yeah. Hey, Ms. Brown, can you provide us background on this particular contract? How long uh, it's been around? How large has the contract been? And like what percentage uh, of money or, or fines we've recovered uh, from this particular contract? Uh, good morning, <clears throat> honorable member of the board. Um, Keisha Brown, acting as city purchasing agent. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the initial award was on November 18, 2015, and in terms of the actual amount of the contract is $600,000, and uh, Chief Miller just described the, the goals that were set at the time, and I believe Director Raymond may be on in order to speak to the collections and the revenue amount. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Director. Yeah, good morning. Again, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Controller, honorable members of the board, I'm Henry Raymond, Director of Finance. Uh, to address the question regarding collections, uh, the vendor collects uh, millions of dollars per year on uh, the delinquent uh, parking accounts. Yeah, and it's, I, I'm not sure you know this, uh, Director Raymond, but is their contract established based off of a percentage of the collection or is it a, just a set fee based off of an annual amount? Uh, set on a percentage of the collections. Understood. Do you know the percentage, yes. uh, Mr. Raymond or Ms. Brown? We, uh, we, we can provide that, but I believe it's less than uh, 5%. Got you less than five percent. Yeah. Now, I, I, thank you, uh, Director Raymond. I guess back to Miss Brown and maybe Chief Miller. Um, for these long-winded contracts, I mean, this contract has been open for five years. The low, the the, the 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 minority participation goal is extremely low. You know, obviously, you know, many folks on this call had absolutely nothing to do about the approval at that particular time. Um, but I guess the question is, you know, week after week. I think this is our fifth, our fifth or sixth uh, our board meeting. Week after week, we're coming across these contracts that have been open for five, six, seven years with extremely low minority uh, participation and women participation goals. Um, one is there. I know that there is not a cure process in place. Um, how can we identify all of the contracts that are currently open, similar to this, that aren't coming back to us for renewals? or aren't coming back for an extension so we can kind of keep our eye out that we can go and kind of correct all of the wrongs of the past. I mean, we constantly talk about, and I'm just gonna be straight, this is a, a, a 
a city with, that's predominantly African American. Uh, this is a city that's predominantly, predominantly African American taxpayers. Um, this is a city that when we look at it from a socioeconomics perspective and business sits really well in our country as it relates to access to minority uh, uh, businesses, not just in the Baltimore city area, but in this particular region. And we continue to go week after week and see these same contracts uh, for pretty mundane things. I mean, we took off salt earlier. We took off carpet and flooring earlier. Now we're talking about a call center, a pretty mundane and kind of straightforward task. Uh, and we're seeing either minority and women business enterprises being completely waived out of participation or access to these contracts, or, you know, kind of, you know, throwing peanuts, you know, of like 3% for very large contracts. So just really trying to understand and know, like, is there a way for me to go and look at all the existing contracts that have been sitting out there that was done in 2015, keeps popping up uh, in 2015 to identify what contracts are sitting out there that are sitting there with these 1%, 2%, 3%, and 4% minority participation votes. Is there a way to do that, Ms. Brown? Um, I believe there is. I think it has to be, a, and and um, I appreciate your uh, um, uh, speech in terms of that, uh, President Mosby. Uh, I can say that Chief Miller and I share in that, and we've had the opportunity to have those conversations. Um, we talk about resources and being able to overhaul and really uh, drill down and look at those contracts. Um, unfortunately, we don't always have the resources to do that. But I certainly believe that with the shared vision of the city, which we agree with wholeheartedly, and it's a pleasure to work with her in that shared vision, that it is absolutely an opportunity to address everything that you uh, bullet pointed in your um, so eloquently put uh, um, concerns about the um, the citizens of Baltimore. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Um, we're understanding you know, the council now more than ever is is ready, prepared, and willing to work directly with you to try to develop one a cure process for all these things that you have to come on week after week and explain uh, to us. I realize that you guys are just the messengers of most of this information, so please understand. I'm just really trying to dig down into the facts and the details of it, um, so we can try to work out a plan of one looking at everything that's existing that's out there uh, and ensure that we develop a process that's equitable and fair moving forward. Um, I believe I saw the hand of Mayor Scott. Mayor Scott, the floor is yours. So thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for your remarks. And I just wanted to uh, restate something that you and I and the Comptroller have talked about before, uh, that we will, we will be looking at our procurement processes, our contract processes from top to bottom to make sure uh, that we're improving and make them more reflective of where we should be as a city. And as you said, I right the wrongs in the past. So thank you very much. No, thank you. Um, at this point, are there any additional uh, questions or concerns? Um, I did have one additional point. It's kind of related to this, but it's definitely related to the past item, Mr. Comptroller. Um, is there a way that when we print the agenda for when the cities are passed through that we don't just say MWBE is waived, that we actually put and, and transparently communicate that this is federal money or this is state money and the city's just acting as a pass through. I think that that will clear up some confusion and it's kind of just pretty straightforward. I'm not sure how that kind of changes your process, Mr. Comptroller, uh, but if you guys could look into that, I think that makes it a lot easier, you know, for us as a board, definitely easier for the agencies that it's it's responsible for. So I'm wondering if you could kind of in include that in your process. We can definitely look into that. I know that right now we draw most of the information on the agenda pages from the board memo sent by the requesting agency. So if that information is clearly provided in the board memo, we can definitely note that in the agenda. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, if you could just kind of look at from an administration perspective, because, um, again, I think the, the more information we have on uh, the memo, uh, the more transparent and the better outcomes we're going to have for everybody. Yeah, I know that this is something that the city administrator has already talked about in so that everyone has a better picture of everything that's going on. 
Got you. Uh, your audio was a little choppy. The mayor said that it's something that he knows about and that they were already starting to work on. So we appreciate that and we look forward for that change. At this point, uh, regarding this particular item, if there aren't any additional questions or concerns, I'll entertain a motion from the board. So moved. Second. This has been moved and properly second. All those in favor of approving this particular item, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Uh, the ayes have it. This item is approved. Thank you again, Chief Miller, as well as Ms. Brown. Next up, we're going to uh, DPW again. Uh, the next item on the non-routine agenda today can be found on page 53, Department of Public Works, termination of contract. Uh, do we have a representative from the agency to speak to this item? Yes, sir. It's uh, Mr. Uh, Cabetta again. Uh, hello again, uh, Yosef uh, uh, for DPW. Uh, we are a uh, DPW Department of Public Works is requesting uh, to terminate a contract with uh, Spinello Companies uh, for convenience uh, uh, prior to the issuance of the NTP, uh, as well as uh, reimbursement to said company for in the amount of sixty three thousand and one hundred twenty eight dollars, uh, which are costs uh, associated with the uh, contract bonds that they had to acquire uh, for uh, Project SC nine thirty R. Uh, I'll provide some general background and then, uh, of course, uh, I can get into the details uh, as you wish. <clears throat> uh, this particular project uh, is uh, uh, was was designed uh, to build a, a wastewater pumping station on the corner of South Clinton Street and Hollaburg, uh, south of Boston Street. Uh, this pump station uh, was deemed necessary due to uh, recurrence of uh, uh, sewage backups uh, at the properties along Clinton Street, uh, as well as um, uh, recurring failures of the uh, force main uh, four inch pipe uh, that runs along that street. Uh, in, in the lead up uh, to the bid, uh, there were several community meetings that were held uh, to <clears throat> um, uh, discuss the, the project. Uh, the, the, uh, the location of the pump station uh, sits right at that very corner uh, uh, where uh, Canton Railroad uh, owns that property. And uh, as I said, during the community uh, meetings and lead up to the, uh, the bid, uh, uh, there were um, conversations uh, and uh, discussions with Canton Railroad for the use of that particular property. Uh, at, um, and and uh, that property was, was deemed to be the most appropriate uh, out of three uh, alternatives. Um, and uh, once the bids came in um, for this project, Spinello was the low bidder. Uh, and uh, soon after, uh, Canton Railroads uh, uh, determined that they did not want to uh, allow us to have that uh, uh, portion of their property for this project. Uh, by that time, uh, Spinello had been uh, uh, notified that they were the low bidder and they had gone through the process of acquiring uh, contract bonds uh, and we <clears throat> uh, had to uh, rescind uh, the, the, uh, the award. And, and that is the reason for the request to uh, terminate the contract as well as uh, reimburse Spinello for the, uh, uh, the, the, the funds expended. At this point, are there any additional questions or concerns, uh, 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 Mr. Comptroller? Oh, before we go to you, Mr. Comptroller, I think yeah. maybe there might be some additional explanation uh, from uh, the director. Barbara. Happy to yield to the director. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Comptroller. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to add a couple of points um, just to, to make sure that, that everyone is aware. It's um, termination is agreed to also by the vendor. So there is no um, debate as to that. So it is not been, it is not a controversial conflict in that regard. And also, Mr. Cabetta, if you, my memory serves, this is um, an issue over existing railroad lines that were under pavement, correct? That uh, uh, when looking at it, when doing a site assessment, when looking at that location, as well as in the existing records and documentation, it was not readily evident that there were rail lines and these are still active rail lines, even though they're 
covered by uh, pavement. That's right. Exactly. They, they are covered over most, and, most, if not all of the rail. And, and getting them decommissioned would require a fairly extensive and expensive federal process. My understanding is that would be about $250,000. Uh, Twenty fifty thousand dollars, along with uh, uh, several years to to execute the process for abandoning. Okay, and it's and mine also, I believe, to the board, there is an alternative to look at um, moving this potential site a bit further or closer north, uh, farther north, as well as some other design um, techniques to redo the uh, force main and the PVC. So I don't think this is absolutely the necessary site. It was a desirable site, but not the only site. It, it, yes, it, it is. Uh, it was the most desirable. It was the the most accessible at the time. Uh, the two other locations, uh, uh, the owners uh, did not want to uh, uh, sell the property, but there are other additional alternatives that we would now be able to look at to to execute this project since it is still necessary for uh, alleviating the, the flooding issues. Okay. So, Mr. Uh, Capetta, you, you said the owners. So, I, so this site, the, the site is not owned or controlled by the city? No, it's not. It, it is, it is owned, this particular site in question uh, is owned by Canton Railroads. Gotcha. And we, we just um, unfortunately didn't do the due diligence or, or didn't know to look that there was uh, some level of the easement associated with the railroad tracks and that that kind of threw a curveball in the job. So now we just want to make whole um, the vendor that was ultimately awarded uh, because they came out with some administrative costs that um, for this job that they will not be paid for. I believe more accurately, I would say the due diligence was uh, was done. Uh, there, there, there were, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, multiple community meetings that were held. Um, and initially, the the response was that this property or this this section would be available for a public works project. And then later on, we were notified that uh, it was not available. And, and as far as the details of the community meetings, uh, the project team is on the call and they can provide uh, some more information on uh, the, the actual discussions that were held, but uh, that was our understanding initially when we went into this. Understood, uh, Director Garbach. Yeah, just I wanna to add to that, um, that there is an easement that was that is in place for the use of this property. So the easement was researched um, through the city's right of way office. Oh, so you knew you, we we knew about the easement. We did know about the easement. It calls okay. for and allows for underground piping and underground assets, and we had, as part of that, um, generally anything that is needed to help assist that is included in the sanitary line is included in that easement. Um, the issue that the Canton Railroad raised was that they were not considering the. Um, the pumping station, which is obviously above the roadway, as being tied to that easement because that would necessitate the decommissioning of those rail lines. So that's something we honestly haven't normally dealt with. We deal with um, the railroads quite extensively, but in maintenance terms, not in uh, new construction um, areas. A lot of the new construction areas are in more residential um, areas and not necessarily the the um, industrial areas where there's going to be a lot of extensive uh, rail lines that are hidden or buried. Uh, uh, thank you, Director Garbach. Thank you, um, uh, Bureau Head uh, Kabita. Are there any uh, additional questions or concerns from the board? I see Comptroller Henry Zing. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so just to be clear about this easement, um, this easement is overtly for underground work and structures, but we, as a general rule, take the position that if we have an easement for underground work, that we can also use it for a related above ground structure. So um, the easement called for, I don't think it specifically said underground, it said pipes, conduit, 
things that would obviously be underground. So we had looked at that being, okay, utility assets, utility equipment, things that are needed to construct and convey the utility line. When we realized and when they noted that there's active, an active rail line that is buried, that then changed it to be, ah, okay, so now they're saying it's only underground and they're their interpretation of this is not above ground and they're sort of citing the exact letter of the easement then. I, the, the reason I ask that is because I had been looking at this um, from the perspective of the city and thinking about how frustrating it is that Canton isn't more willing to work with us. But as I'm hearing this part explained, I'm now thinking about it from the perspective of a property owner. And if, you know, I have a house with a backyard and when I bought this back, this, this house and backyard, I was told the city has an easement on the backyard for pipes and conduits and stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, well, that's fine. That'll be underground. That's not going to ruin my view of my backyard. And then the city comes along and tries to build a pumping station in my backyard, that's a very different thing than I was expecting as a property owner. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, who 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 is it that makes these calls of what an easement actually conveys in terms of site control when the city is looking at a development project? At what level is that decision made? So we work, in, and again, Mr. Cabet, I don't mean to jump in here, but you know, the um, uh, we work with our engineers. We have engineers of record. They do site visits and and look exactly there. Then we work with the Department of Transportation's real uh, right of way office to look and um, get plats and existing um, uh, titles and land records and other things. And then we also have the law department's real estate division. Um, review all of this stuff as well to see what is existing and what is there. Uh, my understanding is that the easement actually isn't in the name of the Canton Railroad. I think it's in the name of the old Canton Company, huh. which eventually devolved into a piece of it, ended up being the Canton Railroad. So these are decades, if not century old documents that we're trying to piece together. And it's not till we actually get on site that and open the ground that sometimes we know what's actually there. I, 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 I'm still kind of looking at it from the perspective that if the easement says it's for things that go underground, then it, it, to me, it feels like a questionable amount of due diligence to flatly assume it's going to also cover an above ground pumping station without checking with somebody outside the city to make sure we're confirming, you know, that we're, we're not just uh, looking at it the way we want to look at it. Um, is having, having now had this happen to us, how has this changed our internal process so that we don't have this problem occurring in the future? So, as as Mr. Cabetta mentioned, we did have a number of meetings, and my understanding is that there was a, a an agreement to move forward. I think it was once the rail lines were uncovered and recognized and realized that then precipitated this sort of backtracking and not wanting to move forward. But my understanding, I believe, is that the parties were in agreement to move forward on this. Yosef, do you want to add to that? The, uh, the, the, uh, the project team was given uh, the, the approval from the company, from the, the Canton Railroad Company. Um, and uh, the actual dimensions were, were noted in terms of, you know, this is the extent of, of uh, you know, the, the, the project. To, to answer your question uh, uh, more specifically, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, this is ob obviously a lessons learned. Uh, since we have, um, uh, as Mr. Garbark mentioned, uh, 
dealing with CSX, uh, Kent and other railroad companies is not new. We typically deal with them when it comes to existing assets that we own, that we need to access for some sort of remedy. Uh, this was fairly unique in that we were uh, uh, looking to, to build on top or near uh, their, their property. So uh, we, we, uh, we thought we did all the things that we needed to do in terms of engaging all the stakeholders. Uh, clearly, this was not uh, sufficient as uh, uh, you know, it kind of went in a different direction from what we expected. So we, we will need to look at uh, specific procedures. <clears throat> that, and, and that's good. I mean, I'm really glad that we're doing that. The, the part that I'm just trying to make sure I'm not snagged on wrong is if the easement actually covered above ground structures, if I, if I understand the point of an easement properly, we wouldn't need the company to voluntarily agree. You know, that, that's what, it, I mean, a real easement means you can do this. That's already the permission. The reason we needed to come to an agreement with Canton in the first place is because the easement doesn't actually give us the ability to build above ground. No, the, the easement, if I could jump in, I don't, you guys yeah. tell me if I'm wrong. So the, the easement is associated with the rail lines. Once it was identified that the rail lines were active and, and potentially readily available, in the mind of the property owner, it significantly increased the value of this particular property. It probably also took them into other directions of what they can kind of do for this particular property. So they basically wanted to cancel and end the deal. So the assumption was that the city was going to, you know, uh, from land acquisition, take control of the site. But then, then once we found or they found oil on the site, they decided that they no longer wanted to participate in this deal. I I can't speak for them. I think that's definitely. I can't speak for them either. But that would be a motivation of a property owner, right? So, Mr. Comptroller, when, when you identify that you have oil in your backyard, maybe you're no longer going to decide to sell your house. It, Okay, maybe I need to be a little clearer on what an easement is. I thought an easement was when the city had pre-established the right to do its work on someone else's property. That's an easement, right? Correct. That's okay. a form of an easement, correct. Okay, and we have an easement on this property that is specifically limited to underground work, conduits, pipes, et cetera. That's correct. Correct. I, what, what, I'm, what, I, what, I think, what I think I'm concerned about is that apparently there is a comfort level inside DPW from past practice of whenever we have an easement for underground work that but what we need includes above ground work to support the underground work. We take the position that we can just do that there also. And we move forward as if the easement is also giving us the right to do the above ground work. And it, even if it doesn't, that's what I'm trying to check in on. Is that happening? Um, to, no, to my okay. knowledge, no. Okay. It is, the issue was we had an easement, we identified the easement. So the piece of the project involving the sanitary line, the replacement of the four inch pipe can go through perfectly fine. That's not an issue. Okay. We had to then go to the railroad and discuss with them the possibility of this pumping station as part of that. They had agreed we then found this active rail line. The issue is either, I believe what either President uh, Mosby said, or since the railroads are exclusively regulated by the federal government, that is an extraordinarily long process that would require um, quite a bit of money and multiple years. And I don't think they wanted to be involved in something like that. Okay. All right, then in that case, the only other question is, uh, can uh, one of you, uh, you know, so if Mr. Solis, Mr. Deputy Director, Mr. Director, um, can, can somebody talk about uh, the steps that DPW is taking uh, to rebid the solicitation and how will 
new procurement, uh, you know, avoid using this particular piece of property. Uh, if you need this pumping station to address the, the basement sewer backups, um, what's the timeline for doing the new solicitation? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Mr. Singh uh, speak to the timeline, but as far as the next steps for us uh, is, is uh, we are in the process of identifying alternative sites uh, and uh, we will need to have some conversations internal and also with the stakeholders to see about the suitability of, of these sites. Like I said, the project, uh, uh, the, the need for the project uh, is still there. So it hasn't gone away. So we definitely need to do something. But Mr. Singh, uh, can you speak to uh, the timeline? Uh, so the, the design of the pump station stands and pretty much we can move it around in that area. The only issue is getting up the real estate and that's what we are trying to look at an alternate site. So we don't have an alternate site identified yet? Not at this time, well, so. Okay. We have a place where we think and would like to put it. This is obviously waterfront property in an industrially zoned area. So the price, the, the mar fair market price might be too much for us to, to pay. So we're looking at, at ways where and, and places to see if there's a place where it would be more affordable, but we know where it would, we would like it to be. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. No, thank you. At this point, are there any additional questions or concerns uh, for the Department of Public Works regarding this item? Hearing and seeing none, um, I'll entertain a motion. Move so approval. Moved. Second. So all, it's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, at this point, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The, eye, the ayes have it. This item is approved. The next item on the non routine agenda today can be found on page 54, Department of Law. Notice of litigation outcome. Uh, do we have a representative uh, from the agency to speak on this item? Yes, I, I believe we have um, Gary Gilkey. Mr. Gilkey, the floor is yours. Well, if he's not, I, I can I can handle it. Um, this is a case that was tried to judgment in federal court involving an equal pay claim uh, against uh, assistant librarians. Uh, the reason the case went to trial is because the plaintiff, the EEOC, was demanding that we agree to a consent decree, uh, which we felt was unnecessarily uh, intrusive because we had already made all the changes that the EEOC wanted uh, and to give them uh, the right to then monitor our business in the, into the future seemed to be too much. So we didn't agree to the consent decree. We went to trial uh, and as predicted, uh, the judge ruled that uh, equal pay needed to be given to uh, the female uh, librarians. Uh, so. The judgment is in. Um, there's nothing for the Board of Estimates to approve or disapprove. The only entity that could uh, disapprove that would be the Fourth Circuit. And we don't think that an appeal is worthwhile. At this point, are there any additional questions or concerns for the city solicitor? Hearing and seeing none, um, I'll entertain a motion. Um, Move approval. For approval. Been moved. Has it been second? I'm sure. I'm not sure there's anything to approve or dis. Oh, oh you just said that. Okay, yeah. so we can move on to the next item. You're right. right. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Solicitor. Um, next up, we're going to move on to the next non-routine agenda item today. Uh, it can be found on pages 55 and 56, Office of the Mayor amended and restated grant agreement. Uh, we have Daniel Ramos uh, on on behalf of the mayor's office, uh, as well as Tisha Edwards, director of the mayor's office of children and family success uh, to speak to this item. Uh, Mr. Ramos or Ms. Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Council President. My name is Daniel Ramos. I'm the deputy city administrator. This is a contract amendment for a grant agreement with Open Society Institute 
to institute a um, cash assistance program, we will be issuing um, $400 debit cards to about 1,500 families and individuals across the city. The need for a uh, for this contract amendment was that um, one of our vendors that was providing the application um, software, um, we ended up going in a different direction contractually with them. So we had to switch the vendors as well as account for the delays uh, in the program. So we so the dates are changing, and then the vendor that is providing the online application. Thank you, Mr. Ramos. At this point, are there any additional questions or concerns from members of the board? Uh, Mr. Comptroller, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so, uh, Mr. Ramos, it's, it's, it's pretty common knowledge now that uh, the $6 million the city is putting into this cash assistance program is coming from the Children and Youth Fund. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how this program fulfills the purpose of the Children and Youth Fund? Yes, sir. So the, the target population, we, we will be giving um, some number of, of the debit cards directly to youth and young adults. We chose uh, community-based organizations and partners that, that reflected that. Um, we also the we also targeted uh, community-based organizations that have experience and have credibility with um, with families. So the, we believe that this this fulfills the mission of the youth fund by by targeting these populations as well as as you know for the community good. Okay, um, I understand that OSI is going to be partnering with twelve community-based nonprofits to distribute the debit cards to families in need. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the 12 community partners were selected and did equity considerations play a role in the selection process? Yes, absolutely. Equity was at the forefront of our selection. When we were partnering with, with OSI, we were looking for, for first just a ge geographic spread. We wanted to make sure that we were targeting um, groups that, that folks could go to in their community. We also wanted to make sure that we were targeting you know, specific organizations that serve specific groups. So you'll see groups that target youth and young adults, returning citizens, um, our immigrants populations. So yes, equity was at the forefront of how we, we chose these. What kind of safeguards are in place to prevent fraudulent misuse of the cards? So there, there are a couple of safeguards and I, I wanna thank um, uh, the city's audit department on your staff for helping to, to develop a lot of these, these safeguards. First and foremost, the, the CBOs are gonna be doing the screening process. So they're gonna be looking at, and we, we try to be as flexible as we could with, with the pertinent documents, but we wanted to make sure that each individual who was applying had something that had their name on it and had an, had an address. Um, from there, once all the documentation is in and, and the eligibility requirements met, these individuals will be given a code for which they were gonna to go to an online application software, which is gonna do a fraud check. So it's gonna look for commonalities in name, addresses, and um, and phone numbers. So also once you receive the card, the um, Baltimore's Promise is gonna be following up with a text and a call to the number on your application to, to make sure that one, you receive you receive the card and you are and the person the person who applied is actually the one receiving it. We also put some some common sense restrictions on it. So the the cards can't be converted to cash, they and it can't be used at places like casinos and liquor stores but it could be used to pay city bills like uh, a water bill online, that kind of thing. Yes, sir. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what metrics or data you're gonna be using to evaluate the success of this program? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're getting bi-weekly reports and we're meeting weekly. We're reviewing the, num the number of um, people in queue by CBO. We wanna make sure that the CBOs are holding up their end of the bargain and that if we need to reallocate certain number of their, their allocation of debit cards, we're, we're gonna be proactive about it. We are looking at how many people are getting kicked out and for what. Uh, we're also looking at the number of uh, fraud checks that get flagged within the system. Um, OSI, as, as part of, of on their own and as part of our agreement, has brought on a formal evaluator. We're gonna be looking at the, the types of stores, the, the geography of comparing between where the person lives or where they applied and where they're actually using their money and on and on what type of store. We can't get down to the individual transactions. We don't know if people bought you know, eggs or milk, but we would be able to, to, to see they went to Target or they went to a store within their community. Okay. Um, is OSI getting any kind of fee for this? 
No, absolutely not. Or no, they they have been very generous with both their time and their their support. They are actually paying them and Annie Casey are paying for all of the administrative fees. So that's the fee to the online to the online software, the fee to the credit card or the debit card company. They are all um, they're paying for the evaluator and they are paying each individual CBO for their time to be to participate within the program. So they are receiving no dollars, and in fact, they are putting up money for the success of the program. That's great. Um, okay, and then my last question, this is really just sort of, uh, I noted uh, a, a news story yesterday about uh, the mayor's commitment to a universal basic income uh, pilot program through Mayors for Guaranteed Income. And I wondered if there have already been internal conversations about how this can be used to provide some data for uh, putting together that uh, UBI pilot program. Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, Mr. Comptroller, we're, we're, we're going to uh, make sure that we brief you and the president separately about that. Uh, being a part of, uh, mayors, of the mayor's group uh, requires certain kind of steps and things that have to be taken. So we'll give you guys a full briefing on that how uh, things, if and when the things can be pushed together, but joining that group has specific requirements that we will definitely be letting you guys know about. Okay. I, I look forward to, to getting that information in the future. All right, that's uh, that's it. That's all of my questions. Thank you, Mr. President. No, thank you, Mr. Comptroller. One quick question as a follow-up, Mr. Ramos. Uh, regarding, we know that chronic absentee uh, uh, has significantly increased because of uh, COVID-19 and virtual school environment. Is there any tie or catch uh, with the, I believe you said 1,500 uh, families will be engaged with uh, around uh, ensuring that um, children are going to school or at least trying to develop uh, different outreaches or initiatives while we have access to them uh, through engaging them with the, the use of this money? So Ms. Burge, one correction, it's 15,000 families. Okay. So, I said 1500. Yep. So the, the, the entire million is, is going to families. It's about it's four hundred dollars um, per applicant. So uh, got it. So, so to the 15,000 families, are we doing any? So yeah, so any creative good. engagement with the school system, uh, knowing that, you know, in certain populations, we have an absentee rate, chronic absentee rate of over 60 percent. So the short answer is no, we're, we're not connect. The, our data systems are connected to anything on the on the school side. Um, what I will say is that is one of the things that we've we've had to toe the line on is figuring out a way to make this accessible to all of our communities, um, regardless of, of barrier, while also like putting you know kind of common sense restrictions in there to ensure that we're we're using government money wisely and that you know it, it's reaching the populations that that most need it. But no, we're we're not connected directly in any way to to uh, the school system. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If the administration could look. Not at developing requirements, but knowing that chronic absenteeism is a huge problem. You know, some of our children uh, are working every day and not going to school. Some of them we might not ever get back in the school system. Um, you know, anytime we have an ability to engage them productively and something that they see as a resource uh, coming from the city to support them, it's just a new opportunity for us to engage them to try to bring folks back into the school system. So. Anything that we can do to try to conflate the, the, the major issue and this huge amount of resource and, and character that we're putting out there, I think will be a good thing. And thank you, Mr. President. I know that uh, uh, Director Edwards is on here and you know very well. Uh, she uh, always is working with the school system and connected. And I know that she will make sure that there's connection to make sure that we're reaching the young people that we know that we need to reach, including those who have not been engaged in school recently. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your commitment on that. Are there any additional questions for Mr. Ramos or Ms. Edwards? Hearing and seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and properly second at this point. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes have it, this item is approved. Next up, Health Department Agreements. Um, this is the uh, next item on our routine. It can be found on pages 59 through 60. Uh, this is again, Health Department Agreements um, and very similar to the other Health Department Agreements that we talked about earlier. Um, this is an item that I pulled off for those same reasons. I think we've spoken to the comptroller as well as with the administration 
The idea is to try to drop more transparency as it relates to our agenda items. So when we are just a pass through for federal or state grants, um, just not to just do the MBWE waiver uh, type of uh, verbiage, I'm going to actually put the specific verbiage on there. I do not have any additional questions or concerns. Again, I pulled this off. Um, are there any additional questions or concerns uh, from the board uh, for Ms. Chief Thompson or Chief Miller? Hearing and seeing none at this point, I'll entertain a motion regarding this item. So moved. Second. Uh, it's been moved and properly second at this point. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes have it. This item is approved. Uh, I believe this is the last item on the agenda. It is the last item on the agenda. Um, uh, it can be found on page 77, Department of Communication Services, Cooperative Agreement. We have uh, Simon Ed Edding, Director of Department of Communication and Services, uh, to explain this item to us today. Mr. Edding. Good, <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Controller, members of the board, I'm Simon Era, Director of Communication Services. Uh, the item in front of you is, um, is a Verizon wireless contract. It's a cooperative agreement uh, with the General Services Administration, GSA. Uh, this contract uh, provides a lot of benefits to the city. Um, it's a five-year contract based on the board letter, but actually it's a month-to-month -month contract. So the city can opt out of this contract at any time. The benefits are we have a 10-month refresh program where we can get uh, pro uh, promotional phones after 10 months. These are the phones that we get for zero dollars. So uh, the end users in the city doesn't, don't have to pay for the cost of the equipment. And also, uh, this provides us discounts on the monthly recording charge. Currently, we spend $39, $39.99 per device for the service. Uh, with this contract, we, we're going to have a discount of $5 on each device. And for our mobile broadband devices, we're also going to have a discount of $3. When we projected that discount, uh, in two years, uh, this city is going to save uh, close to half a million dollars. Mr. President, you're muted. Got you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Etta. So what I've heard is that we're going to have newer, more up-to-date devices. It also will, in the long run, save the city money, uh, and that's why this is on the routine agenda. This is why this was placed in the agenda, correct? That's correct, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adder, for explaining that. This was an item that was added very late. That's why we pulled it off. Uh, we just wanted, again, full trans transparency to kind of talk about it. Are there any additional questions uh, or concerns uh, from the board regarding this item? Again, Mr. Adder, thank you so much for your time. At this point, I will entertain a motion. I move. Second. Item has been moved and properly second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes have it. This item is approved. Mr. Um, President. Yes, Mr. Controller. Just want to note that um, I had already um, listed my intention to abstain on this item under the abstentions at the beginning of the meeting. No, thank you, Mr. Controller. Please allow the, the, the record to reflect that the Controller has um, abstained from this item. Uh, the item is approved at this point. Uh, we're at the closing and adjournment. Are there any additional questions or concerns from the board? Yes, Mr. Comptroller. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I had uh, actually sent an email uh, last night to the city solicitor uh, to get a clarification on something. I had seen uh, an article yesterday in which it was asserted that uh, elected officials are required to have trips approved by the Board of Estimates even when no city money was being used for the trip. Um, and I just, as an elected official for several years now, I didn't remember knowing that or being told that. So I had reached out to the city solicitor and he has already, um, you know, 
reported back that he's going to be looking into where exactly this rule is. But based on a, something that you said earlier about the board not really needing to approve the EEO uh, legal settlement, it prompted me to wonder um, what would the rationale be behind having the board approve something that didn't involve city money. And so I was just going to take this opportunity to ask to add that into the request is even if this is something that is on the book somewhere, whether it's code or administrative manual or something, um, if, if I could also ask for some research into what was the intent behind it, uh, such that somebody felt that this board needed to be approving something that did not actually involve city money, considering that is generally speaking what we do. Um, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to add that to the request. And I believe all the members of the board were copied on the original email. Mr. Controller, so, so noted. We, we'll get back to you very promptly on that. At this point, are there any other additional uh, questions or concerns uh, from the board? Uh, hearing and seeing none, as there is no new business before the board, we will recess until bid opening at 12 noon. The Board of Estimates will reconvene February the 17th, 2021. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Please wear your mask. Please continue to wash your hands. Let's stay safe. We must beat this thing called COVID-19. Goodbye, Baltimore. I love you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Good afternoon. The Board of Estimates is now in session for the receiving and opening of bids. As part of the overall effort to limit transmission of the COVID-19 virus, the Board of Estimates is conducting bid openings virtually. Members of the public can call in to listen to bid openings live by calling 1-408-418-9388 and entering access code 179-826-5819. Board of Estimates meetings are broadcast live on Charm TV, Channel 25 on Comcast Cable in Baltimore City. Meetings are also streamed on the internet at https colon forward slash forward slash www.charmtvbaltimore.com forward slash live hyphen stream. The Board of Estimates will continue to conduct bid openings virtually while the state of emergency declared by the Mayor of Baltimore and the Governor of Maryland remains in effect. No addenda were received. Today's bids to be received February 10th, 2021. Number one, transportation TR 20303 Frederick Avenue slope repair. Uh, bid bond check amount if bid is over $100,000, 2%. Uh, transportation TR20014, Urgent Need Contract Citywide. That's just a great name for a contract. Urgent Need Contract Citywide. Uh, bid bond check amount of 2% if bid is over $100,000. And finally, Recreation and Parks, RP20810, Garrett Park Court and Stormwater Improvements. Bid bond check amount 2% if bid is over $100,000. All right, the first bid. Oh. Oh. All right, the first bid is from P. Flanagan and Sons Incorporated. And we have a bid bond. And the bid is in the amount of $1,694,197.25. And Um, 
All right, have a bid bond. Yes. All right. And okay. I think is this is this allied? Okay. Yeah, it's like I was looking for a title page. And There we go. Thank you. Allied Contractors Incorporated with a bid bond and a bid amount of $1,719,290 and no cents. All right. Third response. Uh, we do have a bid bond. All right. It's from Civil Construction LLC, and the bid amount is. One million six hundred and eighty thousand three hundred and ninety two dollars and zero cents. Is this the duplicate? It doesn't say duplicate on it, but I'm assuming that is. All right, it does have a bid bond. And this bid is from Maverick Construction LLC. And we'll be with holding a great, great difficulty all top gun jokes. And the amount is one million seven hundred and ninety-eight thousand three hundred and ninety-five dollars and zero cents. Okay, second contract. Oh, sorry. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, so carried. Second contract, uh, TR20014, urgent need contract citywide. I just excited for the opportunity to say that again. Okay. There we go. Duplicate. All right. We have a bid bond. And this contract appears to be from E and R Services Incorporated. And Bid amount. There we go. A bid amount of one million five hundred and eighty-seven thousand seven hundred and seven dollars and zero cents. All right. This next one. For the bid bond. Um, huh. right. Well, hmm. Mine is blank. It's not blank. Okay. Yeah. I suspect I don't have the duplicate. <laughs> I mean, I suspect I do have, I suspect I have the duplicate. Yeah, so they might have just gotten the cover page. Cover page, okay. Yeah. All right, so we have a bid bond. Excellent. All right, uh, this is from P. Flanagan and Sons. 
a bid in the amount of one million seven hundred and eighty three thousand seven hundred and twenty two dollars and eighteen cents okay. and the third this is the third bid for the second All right. this Um, what page is your bid bond on? Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Yep. We have, I have a bid bond also. All right. This bid is from Manuel Luis Construction Company Incorporated in the amount of one million seven hundred and seventy one thousand eight hundred and thirteen dollars and sixty two cents no moved and seconded all in favor say aye aye any opposed motion carries and the third and final contract RP20810, Garrett Park Court and Stormwater Improvements. Ooh, several. Yeah, we have a bid bond. Uh, this bid is from P. Flanagan and Sons Incorporated. Uh, oh, here we go. And the total and the amount for the, the bid is $353,286.00. Okay. We have a bid bond. This bid is from Monumental Paving and Excavating Incorporated in the amount of $384,386.52. We have a bid bond. This bid is from Allied Contractors Incorporated My bid line is blank. Yeah, that's weird. Is that problematic? Okay. Well, then we will go with this version, which says their bid is $433,000 and no cents. All right, we have a bid bond. This bid is from the American Asphalt Paving Company, LLC. And the bid is in the amount of four hundred seventy-two thousand seven hundred eighty-five dollars and zero cents. And last, we don't know yet if it's leased. All right. Yeah, we have a bid bond. Uh, this bid is from DSM Properties LLC, and it is in the amount of three hundred and sixty-four thousand 
Uh, oh, yeah, the last one was Wrecking Parts. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Our business here being concluded. Uh, the Board of Estimates will adjourn until next week. Is that, that? Oh, no, we have a recess next week. Uh, we will be recessed next week. So the next meeting of the Board of Estimates will be Wednesday, February 24th at 9 a.m. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. Yeah.